Hello, fellow humans. Uh, I would like to um, first announce a couple of things. I usually speak about things remotely related to Agile. So if you're expecting something right on in Agile, you can leave it uh, right now. I also talk a lot. Usually there are like five minutes for questions, if you're lucky. Um, but I'm usually available for you to ask me as many questions as you want, if you want, after the fact. You can contact me on LinkedIn and it will be very easy because I've not given my contacts. Um, I would like us to start by playing a game. And it's a game of uh, two truths and one lie. So I picked three books that you may know or have heard about. And I picked three quotes, or actually I picked two quotes and invented a quote. I would like you to tell me what you think. The first one is from With the End in Mind, a fairly sobering book. And the quote is, the death rate remains 100%. And if it is the quote, I can tell you that's one of the happiest moments of the book. <laughs> from Scrum, the Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time, Doing half of something is essentially doing nothing. If it is one of the quotes of the book, it is one of the happiest quotes of this book. And from McKinsey, you know I never forget them, uh, from what every CEO should know about generative AI, the robots may one day take over. And if this is the real quote, it may be one of the happiest quotes of the survey. So A, B, C, who votes for the fake quote being the death rate remains 100%? Okay, it seems we have a consensus. Doing half of something is essentially doing nothing. Do you think it's the fake one? Whoa, interesting. And the robots may one day take over. Okay, you want to know? Okay, that's good because that's my next slide. Actually, <laughs> actually I've, put, uh, I've put a black one because I was afraid that I would click too fast. <laughs> so this is the one. And this is false for two reasons. First, it's McKinsey. Second, um, second actually, their study is very good. And they didn't say it because, admittedly, well, this is not accurately the case. But if you really think about it, they have already taken over. And I'm not speaking about the robots you're thinking about. I'm not speaking about the mega factories and so on. I'm speaking about your coworkers. Because if you think about it, how many times do you meet people who are just graduates, they're full of energy, they want to change the world, and then they get the best manager possible? and they get into a transformation that is going to crush their soul. <laughs> and uh, very quickly, of course, they learn not to do that. They learn to don a mask and wear an armor and to look good. They're dead inside, but they're looking good. You recognize people like this? Yeah, I've been like this. Um, and that is really sad because at the, people, uh, at the beginning, people complain and then they stop complaining. And then, well, they stop doing anything. And that's bad because doing half of something is essentially doing nothing. And that's doubly bad because the death rate remains 100%. So if you spend half of your time dead already, why are you here? So that's why I want to bring life back. And so I went back to the source like every religious academic. And I will tell you that next. But what's in it for you is that you probably didn't go and do agile or change because you just wanted to improve the bottom line of companies. You probably wanted to do things with people and bring a better world. So what you will have in this um, presentation are two metaphors that you can use. Maybe you, you know them and you can use them differently, or you may discover them and see, wow, I can actually use that. And a bunch of tips, about 20. I never go into the details of my stuff. If you have questions, you come call me. Um, and they will treat about keeping aliveness in you, unleashing aliveness in others, and because it's so easy and so sad, not crush aliveness when it comes. So where is aliveness? Well, like every scholar, I went back to the book 
and you can find aliveness in the manifesto. You can find it in the sense of adventure that you have in uncovering new things and in the sense of connectedness that you have in helping others and individuals and, and togetherness and interactions, collaboration. You have also the notion of values and the action with responsiveness, developing, doing. All these feels alive. And then, um, <laughs> well, um, I know that we've been saying that I would not say anything, so this is called safe six. Um, and there is a little bit less life. You, you can notice it actually though. There is exploration written here and coordinate and coordination. And it would be easy to beat on safe. But is there more life in less? Is there more fun in unfix? Even in this one, I'm, I'm pretty shy actually. It doesn't show when I'm on stage because that's my place. But as soon as we're in a bar, we have to talk, we don't have a role, I don't feel at ease. I left at 7.15 on Sunday night when the speakers were together. The one, two for all is terrible for me because one, two for all, it's quick, quick, your best idea in five minutes. Well, no, not for me. And so all these things may either intentionally or unintentionally constrain life. And not always constraints in a way that is productive. Because really, life is in you. They are not doing anything wrong on that matter. They're doing wrong on other matters. But life is in you. Joy, empowerment, adventure, all these things, they're in you. That's why you're here. That's why it's not a robot implementing safe. So let's take a break. And let's go back where we can see a lot of life, when we can see places teeming with life, forests. So forests are full of life, but it doesn't start like that. It starts eons ago with rocks, and then lichen sticking onto these rocks and breaking the rock and use, working, teeming with, um, with water to break the rocks into gravels and sand. And then uh, other seeds can take root because they also have the organic matter of the lichen that died to um, grow flowers and then, uh, I mean grass, then flowers, then shrubs, then um, small trees and then large trees. And there are three things that are important about this. It goes in sequence and as David Crow said yesterday, you cannot say there is a phase one and a phase two and a phase three. It is a continuous movement over eons. And these are just simplified for our understanding. The second thing is the thing that I love and the thing that matters is here. It's the soil. We look at all the flowers and the branches and the fruits, but without the soil, none of this is there. And the third one is it takes times, hundreds of years. And then at times you have a fire and it starts again. Same sequence, soil, time. That's how we, that's how we grow forests. So you, you take seeds, you put them in the ground, you get saplings, and then in four years you get a mature tree. Who attended my presentation last year? A few, couple? Okay, well that's going to be a surprise then. Um, here you see a lot of shortcuts. Only seeds, only trees. Only four years. Well, I can tell you that um, we, have a, we have a project plan for that. That's a, a four-year forest transformation roadmap with key stages. And it's editable. And if you ever want to watch my talk from last year, you will see that it's derived from the three months agile transformation roadmap. It gets better. It's not just the forest we do that for. We do this for agriculture. When we, when we create food, we create food by saying, we need to have this, we'll bring it there. So we go and mine nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium and, um, and the rest, sulfur, magnesium, calcium. We bring it to the location, we break the ground, we kill everything inside, the, the worms, the mushrooms, everything that could have supported the plants. And then mechanically, we put the things in, we pull the plants, grow them artificially, and then we start again 
with a soil that is deader and deader. Versus the long way. The long way is, well, what's growing here? What's the potential that's there that we could leverage? What could we amplify so that it's big enough that we have enough to eat? It is literally team with life. Well, one is the engineering way. It's reductionist. We understand the world, or so we think. And we are going to ignore the place. We're going to use the oil from somewhere else. We are going to use the machines that we have created. And we are going to import the nutrients. And we will focus on doing a lot and doing it fast. The other side is much more scientific. We try to understand what's going on. We try to accept the complexity that is there and understand that every move can actually have long consequences. So we try to learn from the place. We try to leverage and amplify what's there. We try to, instead of importing the nutrient, recycling them. And that's a lot slower. It's not efficient, but it's effective. And much more importantly, it's steady. Regenerative agriculture is essentially paradigm shifts after paradigm shifts. Instead of compelling and competing with nature, we try to leverage it and partner with it. Instead of disturbing and destroying the soil, we try to protect the soil. Instead of monoculture, we try to get pluriculture or even go further with agroforestry. You, you actually plant in between the trees. You can actually have um, animals that graze uh, in the middle. And instead of reductionist, it's really trying to see the bigger picture. Now, there is a trick with this one. This picture is actually created by General Mills, which is, um, of course, one of the giants of agribusiness. And if you really look at this, well, no, that's not generative, uh, regenerative agriculture. If you see the soil, it's pretty dead. But at least they're trying. Permaculture has a certain number of principles that relate very much with um, system understanding. And so that led me to consider something. What if, what if we were trying that on people? What if we were actually growing people, instead of growing people, helping people grow, because frankly, they grow on their own. I have three daughters, I know that. What would it feel like? What would it look like, sound like? Do, do you know this guy? Benjamin Zender. Go on YouTube, check his TED talk. It's called The Power of Classical Music. And he has an expression which is called shiny eyes. For him, as a conductor, he feels that he succeeds when the people in the, in the place where he, are, he is have shiny eyes. And you can see that these guys definitely have shiny eyes. If you have children and you've seen them completely enthralled in what they are doing, you know that the sense of flow, the sense of being completely involved in what they are doing, they, you can not hear them and think, oh my god, they died. No, they're busy. They're doing something. That's fantastic. You want them this way. Um, and then there is connection. Uh, are there a lot of British guys here? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, well, I mean, you've beat us enough. But uh, recently, we sort of um, settled the score. Um, all this connection, flow, um, shiny eyes, performance, it's not a process, it's all correlated. It comes at the same time. And it comes with a lot of other things, but I, I will insist on one, agency. Very often we speak about empowerment. We say we want, to, we want to empower people, but the thing is actually empowerment is very artificial. It's as if you were saying uh, we want to grow corn. No, what you do is you open a door, you open a window, and it's up to people to go and see or to step through. Y you cannot do this for them. So you don't grow them, you help them grow. And in terms of aliveness, agency is ours and ours alone. So it's in you. It's in you and it's in the moment. So there is something dramatic about it and fantastic about it. It's in the moment, which means it's now. So so you may not take it, but it's now again, every single moment. And so 
Because it's in every decision we take and in what drives you, you have this power again and again, which at times when I think how I handle things with my wife, I should really look at these sides more often. Um, you have the power to handle things from fear or from love, from what you want to create or from what you're afraid of, from what you appreciate, from what you're grateful for, or from what you are envious about or jealous about or scared about. I was not scared of this and that still happened. <laughs> um, who knows the stories of the, the legend of the two wolves? Not a lot of people. Okay, so basically it's a, it's a Cherokee story and it's, well at least that's the legend and that's completely okay this way. Basically it's told as a Cherokee lead legend and it's an elder who, spo who speaks with his grandson and he says there are two wolves in you and they are um, fighting and at the end the, um, uh, the child asks, um, but who wins? And the elder says, the one you feed. And so to me, that's really related to the fact that moment after moment, you have this choice to go for the life or to go for death. So how to feed the light wolf? Well, connecting with your aliveness means first knowing you. It can take a long time, but knowing what works for you, knowing not just your mind, but what enlightens you, what uh, touches you, what makes you be at your best. And there are quite a few things you can do on that. Then caring for you, because at some point you can't run on empty. And these things, they're there. But we know we're all different. If you look at David or Gabrielle or Greg um, or, or uh, Scott, we're completely different. Uh, he was up till 3 o'clock in the morning yesterday in a bar and I was up until 3 o'clock in the morning trying to finish my presentation. And we were both happy. So you will need different things, but you'll need this. And then you need to do you. And do you means saying yes but really wholeheartedly yes or no. Not now, not like this. Like that maybe, but really owning your answers. I had promised to Scott that I would be here this morning with him when he launches Being Better Together. But I owed you a better presentation and I can talk to him next week. So I had to say no, not now, not like that. And yes to you. All this can take quite a lot of work. And so one way to look at this, and I'm not selling it, but personal agility is one way to ask yourself questions and to ask them very regularly. And there is power in habits. There is a lot more work beyond this. And the next slide is probably going to be scary. These are the kinds of things that I've been doing, working on. Enneagram, shadow work, trying to see what doesn't work, um, triggers, etc. Attend Plum Village Retreat, it's a Buddhist, um, Buddhist temple. Um, have tea with your thoughts when you're scared or when you are angry. What, what are your emotions and your th thoughts and stories trying to tell you? They're probably trying to defend you, protect you, explain something to you, and then you repress them. Uh, from Coach to Awakener, Robert Diltz was one of the founders of uh, NLP, and he's, his training on Coach to Awakener is amazing. Uh, a Course in Miracle is a book that I tried to finish three times. Most people who do don't finish it. Really phenomenal in terms of understanding how you fit in the world and um, how you are really small and really big at the same time. Hoffman Retreat, one week, change your world. Landmark Forum, three laws of uh, performance, the same. If this seems like a lot of work, I propose reggae <laughs> and just be cool. It works very well as well. You will need one of the two so that you can help others. Because if you have baggage, if you are triggered, you cannot help others. Life is everywhere, so you need to cultivate it and not crush it. How do we cultivate it? Well, following principles from permaculture, I'll, think of, uh, I'll share one. Produce no waste. It doesn't mean produce no waste. It means reuse the things that didn't work. Learn from the things that didn't work. 
you need to see life in others and you probably see people through labels. So for instance, I probably have a label of being French. I probably have a label of this guy speaking too long, he's never going to leave us time for questions. This one is probably true. Um, so what you can do is you can try to remove them and if you're not good at removing labels, add more. You will get sort of the same, you'll get a multifaceted person and not just unidimensional. Asking, asking is phenomenal. When I, when I started to take executive roles when I was um, head of change at Cathay or head of digitalization or chief transformation officer at Eurasia, I realized that I was scaring people. And so it really helped for me to, to take a, um, a place of non-authority and to ask people, um, what do you do best? Um, what would surprise me of you? Um, what would you be willing, and by the way, the nuance is super important. What would you be willing to teach me? Because I used to say, what can you teach me? And that doesn't sound the same at all. Um, so what would you be willing to teach me? What do you want to contribute? What kills your joy? And then, well, that's when your leader role starts. You have to figure out a way to match make. Not simple, but people notice it. You can also change your encounters. I love walking conversations. Um, I love to play with people, not mind games, but board games, um, go, chess, anything. It's an incredible revealer. Uh, this picture is actually a, a game called Dune. It's the equivalent of diplomacy in space, and it's a great way to, to lose friends. But in this case, um, we won with that guy, and not one time over nine hours did we lie. Neither I nor him. We told the truth, the entire game, it was an experiment, and we still won. Help people shine. The one that connects for me uh, the most is the idea of stepping into discomfort. There are, I remember when I was working with Singaporean government and HP, it was a $2 billion program, you can imagine I never worked on a bigger program than that, and it was we had agreed that the program would end. And we wanted to have everyone on board until the last day. And of course, people wanted to find a job. So we did two things. The general manager showed he cared by organizing job fairs with the competitors of HP so that people who would not be kept in HP could find jobs. And at the same time, we held a three-day workshop where we honestly discussed, some of you are going to lose a job, some of you are going to keep it. You've been through thick and thin together. How are you going to support each other? How will you be vulnerable with each other? People were, especially in management, really scared about addressing this, and it was amazing, and people did not leave. Um, the notion that matters to me the most is actually to be, to be there when people need, and to do as if it never happened. People will crumble. Work is about work. It's not necessarily about people in many places. So they will crumble. You need to be there and not make it a matter. Surprise them. I love this thing. Uh, do you know um, a collaborative product owner from Tobias Mayer? Phenomenal old training. He, he used to do a thing. He, he would ask you to draw something you loved that you wanted to bring into the world. And so I, I drew this thing that became a charity that we have now called Enablers Without Borders. Imagine it as um, Doctors Without Borders, but for people who do change and agile, etc. And at the time it didn't exist. And so I created that and I was ready to express it. And so he brings us at the table and then we put our things there. And then he shuffles the cards, he gives my card to someone else. And I was feeling, Wah! <laughs> you're, you're stealing the thing from me. And that's exactly that. Because this is collaborative product owner. If you're the collaborative product owner, you're never going to own the whole thing. So somebody is going to take your idea and present it in a poor way, and that will be okay. So that was a phenomenal way to bring life and to let, let you step into the role. And then don't crush aliveness. Um, lighten your luggage. We all have triggers things that make us react, overreact, and then 
hurt other people without knowing it. And if we're not aware of these, we're still doing it, but we have an impact on people and we can crush them. Dig carefully. You can see that I spoke about getting into discomfort. I still recall one day when we were going to talk to, at a conference with one of my team members and I was grilling him and it was too much pressure for him and he crumbled. I didn't see it. So it's really important to, to see that like when we dig in the street or when we dig on the ground, we don't know what lies beneath. So we need to do this really carefully. And don't take all the space, which is really easy to say for me since I'm the speaker right now and I haven't left you any time for questions. But the key point is, um, actually, I'll go with this one. This one is phenomenal. Let people shine if you have a team. And it took me time to realize that if I was saying anything in a, in a meeting, no one in my team could actually shine. So I took the habit of only participating to briefings one-to-one -one and debriefings one-to-one. -one. They would attend, they would present, they would lead. There were exceptions, there were places if we went to talk to the CEO, the CEO would want me to be there. But I would be there on the background. And the key thing is, I don't think once, I, don't, I can't recall once where I was disappointed. And that's sort of a dance. I used to say, um, I, I need to let them do it. But actually, one of the things that was the most interesting for me was when people started to tell me that they wanted to take ownership of something or that they didn't want to take ownership of something. And I realized that one of the good ways for me to be a, a, a leader was to actually be a follower for them. So these are the key points, but of course it will only work if you do it. And I'm done. Thanks.